today by the offensive coordinator at the University of North Carolina, Coach Phil Longo. Coach, introduce yourself to our audience. I'm currently the offensive coordinator at North Carolina. I've had um, uh, been very, very fortunate. I, I'm working for uh, a guy that I think is the best boss in college football and in our football coach, Mac Brown. And uh, right now our team offensively is led by uh, quarterback Sam Howell, who's going into his third year in this offense um, at UNC. Uh, came from Ole Miss. Before that, I was at San Houston State and countless other places I can't even remember now. So right now we're, we're, uh, we're in day five of uh, spring ball, Coach. Now, Coach, who have been some of your biggest influences in helping shape your offensive philosophy throughout your career? Well, I, and I think uh, that's no secret. Mike Leach is probably the uh, the greatest impact for me from my career standpoint in the passing game. Um, I don't know if there's a better way to throw the football. That's my own opinion, but um, it has certainly uh, it changed uh, how efficient, how effective, and how explosive we were. Um, I, I fully believe in in the air raid philosophy with regards to throwing the ball. And, you know, Cliff Kingsbury um, may be one of the best game plan coaches I've ever been around. You know, we did a, a 10 year study on a number of the top pro and college coaches, so many different great offensive coordinators. And when you broke down all the wrinkle or the game plan plays that all of those guys put in uh, from a week to week standpoint, there was there was nobody better from a a production standpoint than Coach Kingsbury. And so that's what, after meeting him in Mike Leach's quarterback meeting, um, I got to know him further. But when he became a coach, even beyond his playing career, uh, I sought him out just because I wanted to, I wanted to know why and how he was so successful doing it. And he has become uh, with with me. And there, there's so many others. I could see it for an hour. You know what I mean? But, yeah. Organizational and, and in a grinding standpoint, it would be George De Leon, right? And um, just just numerous other coaches. So I would say, from a schematic standpoint, um, Mike and, and Cliff are two of the bigger ones. Uh, you know, the only difference between maybe what Mike does and what we do is that there's a much greater emphasis running the football in, in our offense than there might be in, in what he what he's doing. Now, kind of going off that a little bit and talking about the air raid, you know, when you, you listen to a lot of stuff that Leach talks about, he talks about the importance of just reps and repetition of, of some of your core concepts. Are you a true believer in that philosophy as well, or, or is there a little bit more in terms of just the game planning and to teaching the information? No, it, it, it's interesting. I think you go a lot of places and you, and you see that kiss sign everywhere, right? Keep it simple, stupid. And, uh, you know, I, I think uh, there are those who do that and there are many who don't. And uh, I firmly believe in that. And, I, and, and what, the, the advantage to keeping things simple is you're going to run less and you're going to run it more often. Uh, we're we're going to have X amount of run plays, X amount of pass plays, X amount of screens. Um, there's, there's roughly 25, 26, 27 concepts based on the year that we carry. Um, and, and they're really puzzle pieces. And so what happens is we... We're going to rep those, and we're going to get X amount of reps at all of those, and we're going to understand how to run the ball against an even front, an odd front, a bare front. We're going to understand how to throw something against, you know, one high or two high, man or zone, cover zero. Instead of uh, adding more plays and more concepts and more schemes, we're, going to, we're always going to run fewer, and we're going to know what our answers are uh, for each of the, you know, the different defenses that we see that, you know, that people run against us. And so... Yeah, I, I firmly believe in keeping it simpler. Uh, we're trying to present multiple pictures for the defense. Don't want to keep it simple for them. Um, but like even our four verticals, we could run that out of 15, 18, 20 different pictures. And it's the same mindset, the same approach, and the same progression for the quarterback. So it's simple on our end. It's multiple on the side of the defensive, uh, you know, from what the defensive sees. And I think um, – we get reps doing the same stuff over and over. So 100% prescribed to, to, to that approach to football. And how much freedom and authority do you give your quarterback to change what he's seeing in front of him at the line of scrimmage? Or is it, you know, kind of still a progression-based read for him? 
So, so for me, the ultimate goal is to get a quarterback to a point where he can just call the offense himself. And we've had that happen three times. So in 32 years, I've had three different quarterbacks that knew the game so well um, and, and just got to a point where I, you know, we had them long enough that they could, they could really, once they know the game plan, they could call it themselves. You know, I, I have no ego with regards to calling plays. I, you know, we still do here in North Carolina, but so much freedom to the quarterbacks. The freedom that the quarterbacks get is what they earn. And, and, and how quickly and how fast and how soundly they develop. And, and the ultimate goal is you'd like them, you want them to get to get to that point. Sam Howell right now understands the game, the offense, and how we want to attack defense as well as I do. And so, you know, he was blessed with all the talent. I wasn't. So now we've got, we've got a guy, a guy out there that understands it from a coaching standpoint. Um, and, you know, I think right now he has the, the ultimate freedom to change anything that he doesn't like. Now, Coach, one of the other things we're going to do here today is you're going to talk to us a little bit about your eight concept. So, you know, floor is kind of yours here. Go ahead and take us over about what this concept really is trying to achieve and then and how you kind of go in installing it. So eight is a, is a foundational concept in the air raid, and that, and that may um, bore some people because I, I'm and just like you, Coach, I'm sure you've heard this concept over and over and over, and I don't know if we run it the same way, um, but there are... Uh, this is a staple in the offense. It's something that we're heating up right now in spring ball as we get ready for the 21 season. Um, and I, I think it's something that, uh, based on how much we run, it's really predicated on what kind of feel the receivers have for it and, and the confidence that the quarterback has in it. And so there are, there are individual years that – you may not see eight as much, or you might not see 92 as much, or you might not see six uh, or 95. Or, and, and really, that's, that's going to be really dictated by our, our skill group. So quarterback has great comfort in it. We're throwing it well in practice. Um, receivers are, are, are confident and want to run it, and it, it, it becomes a bigger factor that year. Rarely do we have a play they don't like. Um, I think sometimes there are, there's a play here and there that um, – is taking more reps than I really want to invest in it. And uh, you have to kind of cut bait sometimes. And so uh, that, that's really how we decide whether we're gonna carry something or not. And then you look at all the opponents um, and, and, and basically you get a feel for your overall schedule and what you're gonna see defensively. And you have to ask yourself, is eight this year really gonna be a, you know, we call eight money. Money is what we call that play. Do we think uh, money will be uh, something that we can carry into most of our games and it'll be an effective, uh, controlled, quick throw for us. So definitely this year, eight is, uh, we're going to run it at a two-by-two two most of the time. It gives us the ability uh, to let the quarterback tag the backside. Um, and so we're going to have a twin set on the backside and the quarterback will pretty much dictate what we're throwing over there. So we have a number of uh you know, a pretty vast two-man two -man game library on the backside that he can go to. That tag is going to be based on. So you'll see in the film there are a few different things that we're doing on the backside. Um, it's, it's built in initially with a dig and an under route. Um, sometimes you'll see slant slant. Sometimes you'll see a deep ball throw. That takes a little bit longer. Uh, you'll see return routes. Uh, you'll see hook curl out there. So it's, it's whatever the quarterback feels, and that's part of the flexibility that he has. So we go through our quick progression on the play side where we're throwing aid or money. The simple progression for the quarterback is corner snag swing. And so our, our number two receiver, our slot or our tight end is gonna run a corner route. Um, it's off of three vertical plant steps. Uh, we talk about our routes with regards to plant steps uh, instead of total steps. I think it's just easier learning and, and uh, easier understanding when they're running the routes. Um, so they're going to go off of three inside plant steps. And then their angle of, of departure for the corner route really is predicated by where the grass is. So there's a lot of freedom and a lot of leeway. We're running the grass. I would say that the corner route and the angle is probably going to be closer to a too high safety uh, than it would be to an underneath cover defender like a corner or a nickel or some, some sort of flat, flat player. So that uh, that's we're really going to probably um, – lean it more towards a higher angle until the quarterback throws him flat and, and through to the grass. The snag route is our wide out route, which 
um, is off of just our, our one step slant on the outside. And if they have uh, grass, if they have zone coverage, as soon as they hug a defender or as they present underneath the defender, uh, or there is no defender, then they're gonna hug it up or they're gonna sit it down and we'll throw the snag. So you'll see the snag will happen after about two steps. Sometimes it's four, sometimes it's six, sometimes it'll work all the way across because they've got man running with them. And so they have that flexibility, you know, to go find grass versus zone and run away versus man. And then our running back, and we have, we have done it two different ways, uh, Coach, in the past. We've run swings with the, with the running back and we run the shoot route with the running back. Um, we're currently doing both at North Carolina. And so the total progression on the play side, which happens very, very quickly for the quarterback, um, is corner snag swing. And in talking to some offensive coaches elsewhere, I, I think the, the thing that I'm finding that differs a little bit is that the corner route for us is our first look. Um, the reason I use the word look and not read, because we're not reading any defenders on this. This is a pure progression uh, concept for us. Um, so we're going we're gonna to try to look off with our face mask, see it with our eyes. Um, we'll throw a corner out if that presents first. Uh, we we kind of hang on that for a second, and then we'll go underneath to the, to the snag and then out to the shoot route. With main coverage, one thing I point out is sometimes we, we, uh, we decide to get off. Uh, this, we go corner to snag and get off the concept and work backside. If we have man coverage, weeks, those are during weeks or game plans where we are not going to try to impede the Mike to the shoot route. So if Mike is running to the shoot route, we have a decision to make against man teams every week. Some weeks we're going to try to impede him by setting our snag down in front or run or burning his toes and running through him. Um, and then that ball will come out to the back now because we know that we're going to stall the man defender that's running with them. Other days, we're going to let the, you know, other games, we'll let that snag run through because there's vacated grass there now in the box. And so we can, if we like the way our wideouts, they do a good job of toe sticking and separating and they can get a little bit of uh, separation so that we can throw the snag. We may let the man defender run through and we'll get off of the shoot if we can't throw the snag. The hopes there is to be able to throw the snag on the move, which is really just a slant now, um, into that open grasp that was vacated by the mic running with the back. So those are the two different um, scenarios or two different approaches that we, we may utilize versus main coverage. If you uh, share the screen, I can pull up some video and show you. Yep, you're good to go whenever you want to take control. All right, let's see what we got here. How about that? Can you see this? Yep, it looks great. All right, let's see if I can. So here we're in a two by two set. We have an off the ball tight end. We have an off the ball tight end to the field. Uh, we're running this uh, at a, from the right middle half. So we're running it into the boundary. The number two receiver is our slot receiver. And right now what he's thinking about is pushing three inside steps. So our, our inside foot with the receivers is always up. Um, that's wide outs and slots. And so hip rotation, we're gonna go through three, three plant steps and our, our corner route will start off on a higher angle and we'll be a little bit closer to the safety. Uh, we, we'd rather have more distance from the corner. And the reason that we want that is because we're going to throw the corner route a little bit flatter towards the sideline. So he has to flatten out and run through the football. And one of the things that we work really hard on, uh, because when I didn't do a good job of coaching this, we'd wind up catching the corner route and going out of bounds a lot of the time. And, and really that only happened because we didn't prepare the, the receivers better. And that, that was all me. What we want is we want to, anytime that we can, if the ball takes us to the sideline and we can't spin it and come back inside um, or work up the sideline, then we have no choice. We're going to go out of bounds and we'll take the 8, 10, 12 yard gain and, and line it up on, on the next down. But ever since we started working the three step chop on the sideline, after we retrieve or receive the football, um, we would ask our receivers or our tight ends or anybody catching this corner route, if they have enough grass, 
They want to dip their left shoulder in this scenario, right? Try to work through the, the tackle, the tackle track of the defender. And we're going to stick our left foot in the ground, then our right, check that, we're going to stick our right foot in the ground, then our left foot, and then our third step, which is our right foot again, is a, is a violent, hard plant step so that we can really lower our left shoulder and try to force our way up the sideline. And in some cases, you know, somebody's not in position to tackle, and that short three-step violent chop is, allows us to maybe decelerate, not go out of bounds, and go get some extra yards after the catch. And that's that's been uh, something that's been a, a drastic improvement for us on this play. The next thing is uh, if this corner route is not open, we now have two approaches to this press corner. We can work outside and sell him on the vertical. We want to make sure that we, we – detach ourselves from the line of scrimmage. So we've got to get a little bit of a vertical push. We want our shoulders down and our helmet down, uh, and then we'll throw him by and we'll come underneath. And if it's man coverage, we're going to stay on the move. If it's zone coverage, then we're going to hug up or settle down, sit it down as soon as we have space, as soon as we have space. So, on, uh, you know, if this is a, a, a press corner in quarters and he's not going to carry us, and we're able to detach, our receivers will sit it down because they have nobody running with them. If this is a man corner out of press, and in this case, it would have to be two man with the, with the two high structure that we have, then our receiver, if we have a defender carrying him, is going to flatten out. He may toe stick to try to create a little bit of separation, and he's going to continue on the route. So we're always running away versus man, trying to create separation and we're going to find space and zone, and they have a lot of leeway um, and a lot of flexibility with regards to uh, settling or throttling in open grass wherever they feel like they're open and they can present to the quarterback. So, And I would say that is more important to our skill guys for us to teach them uh, the identifiers or the keys or the tendencies or the cues on the defensive side to, to denote or, or discern which, which keys or, or, or uh, indicators tell us that this is zone coverage or man coverage. It's more important, Coach, for us to know zone coverage or man. Uh, the only reason we even have, we care at all about knowing if it's one high or two high is we'd like to know if the, the nickel or the will and the corners have immediate safety help or they do not. So in a two safety structure, we know that there's immediate help with the safety. That help may be different depending on what coverage is being employed, but they have an immediate safety to that half of the field. And, you know, that, that changes some things at times. So if it's one middle safety, there's going to be no immediate safety help there. Um, it allows us to be a little bit more aggressive. But at the end of the day, they have safety help or not, and is it man or zone? Those two factors are in our opinion, a hell of a lot more important than knowing the actual coverage. I'd say the only exception is if they're employing some sort of cloud or trap coverage. That's kind of the uh, the big, that's the change up pitch and coverages is whether or not they're gonna cloud it or not for us. Um, and then the last route we're gonna have is gonna be uh, a third receiver. It could be a motion receiver. It could be a third guy to the formation. You know, day 101 install, it's our running back and he's pushing on the shoot route. And as I said earlier, that has been a swing. Um, if we motion the back, we late fast motion the back, it'll be an automatic swing. But the progression for us is going to be uh, one over here to the corner. It's going to be two to the snag and it's going to be three. And we are never reading defenders on this concept. The quarterback has his his own uh, flexibility. He he can he can work one reload or three quick. Here, Sam Howell is working three quick. So his trigger foot, his right foot steps first. We we kind of back out a little bit. I I've stopped using the word backpedal out because it's not really a backpedal um, to me. That's a corner technique, right? So this is simply where we we basically walk pace our drops. I want them to be really relaxed when they throw. So we're very relaxed in our drop, particularly in the quick game. So they can go one reload, which is a one step and slide, uh, which is, you know, I think becoming very popular right now. And then you can also, if they like the rhythm better, um, 10, 
uh, Sam Howell on money tends to like the uh, the three quick approach. So it's right foot, and then we're going to go left, right again. And he's just going to set himself. Feels like it gives him a little bit more time um, to look off with his face mask and and to give the corner time to attack grass. So this corner out by the slot off of the third step now, he's going to run a slightly higher higher angle initially when we turn. Um, here he's going to be a little bit flatter because there's no depth by the safety. So he's trying to attack the grass. And I would say that uh, if this is the, the original alignment of the corner and the original alignment of the safety, you know, the midpoint is there. And we'll probably be a little bit higher than the midpoint until the ball flattens us to the sideline. So where this ball hits us, you know, and I think Sam would say, hey, he'd like to hit that a little sooner. Yeah, we, if, we could, if we could hit the strike point right there, we might be able to three-step chop that, lower our left shoulder and try to blow through this safety. Maybe get ourselves two, three more yards, maybe break a tackle and we're off to the races. And so that's a greater emphasis now. Here in this scenario, obviously, he, he doesn't have, you know, he doesn't have that luxury. We're catching the football closer to the sideline. So now the concern is make sure that we're in and then we'll take the eight or 10 or 12 yards that we think we're gonna get on this play. So that's a first progression throw. Ball's out now, no stress on the offensive line. Quarterback's obviously not getting hit. And I think anytime we can go into a game with a play where we're gonna throw the first look a high percentage of the time, you're obviously gonna have greater success. End zone shot, three quick. We like the corner, ball's out. I think that's Josh Downs doing a good job of catching the football. First and 10, we'll line up, run it again. Here we're in a two by two set. And uh, we're now running it to our tight end. So this is, this is our tight end here. Back still gonna run the shoot, still got the snag in here. The corner now is higher, so our angle uh, of, the, of the corner route might be a little bit higher because we're going to try to attack that midpoint that we talk about all the time. Now, the one, the one thing I didn't bring up yet is if the corner were to excessively bail, and what we call that, we say it's if there's Skelly dropping, right? And Skelly, you always get a much deeper drop by a lot of these players than what you may get realistically in team. I think Coach Bateman and the staff do a great job defensively of uh, insisting that their guys cover things the way they're going to in a team setting. So we, most of the time, I think we get a realistic, a realistic looking Skelly and that makes Skelly more valuable to us. Um, this corner is gonna be a little higher because the corner is softer. If we did get an excessive drop or a Skelly drop, as we said, then the slot can turn that thing underneath if he feels like he can attack grass there and, and still be a green light receiver in the progressive here. After the corner route, if, if we're not going to, if we don't feel like we can get open, uh, typically we'll try to split them and, and become what we call a take two corner. You know what I mean? We just want to occupy two people. As soon as we occupy two people in a zone setting, we have one zone defender underneath. We know help is coming. We know help is coming, but if we can hug this up, okay, if we can wrap his hip and sit it down as soon as he passes. The, the harder they're pushing to the flat, the faster they're pushing to the flat, the more we're gonna hug their hip and settle up uh, quicker, almost immediately after he passes. We don't wanna carry our route further inside to the help that's coming. So typically if this is a big push team and they're gonna push this defender to the shoot route, if, if we don't, if they don't have great leverage and that ball can come out, because he's hanging in here and the snag's not open, the ball ultimately will go to the third look and that'll be the shoot. So he's going corner, snag, shoot. This alley player right now is, is, is hauling ass. So we are gonna push behind him. We're gonna hug up now. We're not gonna take this route any further to the, to the Calvary that's coming from the inside and we're gonna put the ball on him. And then what we're asking the quarterback to do and I, and I can admittedly say when I was much younger, you know, in the first four, five, six years of my career coaching, I thought the coaching point of trying to throw 
to a particular armpit or a particular number or to one side or the other. You know, having been a quarterback, I thought, you know, it's really difficult just from a, a standpoint of being accurate, just getting it there on time and accurately is, is difficult enough. And so early on in my career, I never talked about landmarking the ball uh, on a receiver. And huge mistake because, uh, you know, they always, everyone says you always get what you emphasize. And so we, as soon as I started coaching it and I started emphasizing it and our quarterback started emphasizing it in their mind with regards to trying, it doesn't always happen, but trying to place the ball to the side where there's more grass, to the side where there's a defender that's further away. And so what happens is our tight ends, our running backs, our receivers, all the skill guys that are catching the football, they start trusting the quarterbacks that are really good at ball placement. You know, beating man coverage is all about ball placement. It's all about putting the ball where the receiver has a shot at it and the defender does not. You know, one of the goals that we have with our quarterbacks against one-on-ones when you're seeing nothing but man coverage is can, can we get through one-on-ones? You're going to make 18, 20 throws without a defender ever touching the football. And that, and that really predicates, I mean, that promotes our guys putting the ball in scenarios where we have a shot and they don't. And in zone coverage, it's really no different. It's for a different reason, but it's no different. So this one, I don't know if it's a great example of it, but we would love for the quarterback to put the ball, right, on the, uh, where's my cursor, on the uh, outside shoulder where we have a defender that's leaving and away from the inside shoulder where we have grass that's getting closed, right? It, that grass is collapsing right now. So if we could put the ball away from the defender that's starting to squeeze this route in the zone window, then we will we'll allow, our skills will allow the quarterback to lead them to the area where there's more grass. Sometimes they have a feel when they're catching it about what's going on and they instinctively can work away from the defender and roll off and get up the field. But a lot of times they don't know. They know they're sitting down in grass, but they have no idea where it's getting squeezed from. Perfect example is a middle hook. You know, I got a nickel on a mic or a wheel on a mic and they're on both sides. Who's squeezing and where's the space? And we can really help that receiver by placing the ball away from the defender and the receiver taking the lead of getting up the field. And I can't tell yet until we get to the end zone. looks like he's hitting him, you know, square on his body. But the, uh, the wide out either has a feel for it right now or because, and this is a great example of what you and I were talking about earlier, because we're not running a thousand different pass concepts, because we run this concept every single day in practice and we start to see every scenario, you'll get to a point where our wideouts should and I think do know that when you have defenders pushing the zone, that more times than not, turning out after catching this football is going to be a lot more conducive to being able to get up the field than turning inside where you've got a mic track into your inside hip. And so I'd like to think that that's why he's doing it here. I'd also like to believe that we're trying to push the ball to the outside shoulder and, and influence the receiver out and away from the defender. So we turn out here and you look at the mic now has to redirect and winds up not making impact until another three, four yards up the field. And then after that, we're probably going to get two or three more before we actually get dragged down to the ground. So there's corner. We're, we want to throw that corner to grass. Grass is not presenting itself, right? So we're, we're going to see the corner route. We've got no grass. Our eyes go to the snag right now. The, the snag route is doing a great job, that wide out. He's got, you know, he's got a player, and that actually is the mic. So he has the mic uh, pushing to him, and he's, he's got good velocity. So we're going to try to get work behind that defender, the one that's pushing to the flat, and hug that up right now and expect the football as the second look. So the quarterback's going corner. No, that corner becomes a take-two corner. We're going to the snag. The ball is actually thrown to the inside, which is not where we really want it. And then he, he's going to roll this thing out. He probably feels uh, the backer from the backside of the formation pushing. And we turn it out and get up the field. So I, I really like everything about this other than I'd say if I was going to be critical on this play, 
I'd like the corner out to take a higher angle so he's a legitimate take two corner. And I'd like to place that ball to the outside shoulder and roll this thing off like our receiver is doing correctly to get up the field. That would be perfect execution of that play. We're going to run the same concept. Here's eight or money up top, still running it to the boundary. This looks like our second team here. So the second receiver inside, he's doing what we want. He's trying to split the two of them. He realizes based on what the safety, the lower safety in the corner are doing up there, uh, based on how they're covering that we're not getting the throw. So he's pushing inside the, the boundary safety and over the top of the corner. And we're trying to occupy those two guys. And that effectively puts this defender here in a situation where he's got an outside strike point to defend and an inside strike point to defend. Uh, and the immediate help is pretty far away. And so if both guys really stretch this thing the way they're supposed to, we're going to have a route inside, outside on that, on that flat player. And this ball is going to be able to come out really quick. So we're seeing corner. Corner is obviously not there. The grass ahead of the corner route gives us nothing. So our eyes are off the corner route. We're going to the snag right now. You know, and in some scenarios, especially in zone, Brian, you can – you can really see both of those routes at the same time. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you can, de depending on your, your quarterback and depending on uh, what you're going to see each week, if it's man, we're going corner, we're hanging on the snag, and then we're going to go to the shoot route. Uh, and with man coverage, if we're not going to pick it or rub it, the shoot won't even be a factor and we'll get our eyes backside. In zone coverage, we, we may at times – uh, particularly when we feel like the underneath aspect of, of money is going to be where we hit it because of the coverage. We may go corner and then bang our eyes underneath, really splitting splitting the grass that you would see between the snag and the shoot. And, and then if I, we're going to do that, the way I coach is I just say, look, see them both, the one that flashes, that's what we trigger. So we're looking at the corner route, see the two underneath, see the picture, the shoot or the snag, whichever one flashes in your mind first, trigger it. Um, I would say day one, though, uh, install is corner snag swing. That's the progression that we're going through. I like where the snag route is hugging up. He is, he's got a guy, he's got a guy coming from the box who's pushing hard to our super back. And so as soon as he disappears behind the defender, as soon as he disappears behind the defender, He's already thinking about hugging this thing up here and working to the open grass that the defender vacates inside. And then one other coaching point for our back is we want to run this shoot two yards, one yard along the line of scrimmage, whatever uh, the C-gap defender sometimes has a greater vertical push. Sometimes he's a little bit thicker into the offensive tackle. Depending on where he is, we may have to adjust our our line of departure from the shoot route in the backfield. Um, if we can get to two yards and push this thing outside the numbers, we will not throttle for the football until we push this shoot route through the paint. The paint for us is the number. So we'll, we'll decelerate and stay off the tick marks. And if we catch the ball on the move, we're now thinking about going through that th same three-step chop to keep ourselves from going out of bounds. So for the back going to the left, we're gonna go left, right, left, we're going to stab that third foot in the ground and get up the sideline as, as hard and as violently as we can, lowering our right shoulder. So we're going corner to the snag here, which we like, obviously, and then we're pushing to get up the field. There's a lot of small, little coaching points, nothing earth-shattering, nothing sophisticated. I mean, this is basic and simple. But I think when you, when you run more concepts, you have less time to teach these and less time to rep them and correct them and get good at them. And I, you know, just, this is just our philosophy, but we just feel like it waters down. Uh, when you have more plays, it waters down your concepts. It doesn't get the same attention. You know, I've got four kids in the house right now. And when I had two, it was a lot easier to uh, attend to those kids. You know, it was a lot easier to attend to my two older ones. Now that I've got four, 
you know, it's a lot more difficult to give them all the same amount of attention. You know, so it, either we, we increase the time I'm spending with them or I've got to decrease the amount of time that they each get so that they all get attention. And I don't think it's any different if you were to go from two plays to four plays or if you go from 12 pass concepts to 24. And we'd rather run less. I'm not saying I'd like to have fewer children, but we'd rather, we'd rather run less plays and be really, really good at them so that I have the confidence and the quarterback has the confidence to, to call and throw them against everything that we see. The backside, and this is a good uh, view of it, the backside here, we're going to run a dig. Uh, we're, we're talking about running that off of uh, four steps. We'll cut it short to three if we feel like we have immediate grass. So if we've got grass in here, he'll cut it to three and turn that quicker. It may be because there was box pressure. It may be because of this scenario where everybody pushed and so we have open grass inside, okay? Um, otherwise, if we do have defenders inside, we'll push it to four. The wideout is running a, a two-step hitch. So we're gonna go too big, too small. Uh, so two big steps to, to, to uh, elevate ourselves over out from the line of scrimmage. And then we're gonna stick two in the ground to stop it. If the hitch is open, the quarterback has uh, any pre-snap uh, view that he has of a really, really soft corner. If he wants to just uh, one step this drop and trigger the hitch, he can do that anytime we have a freebie. That's a heck of a lot easier than going through corner snag swing, which isn't difficult. But the casino odds say it's a lot easier to throw that hitch out there. And so we're going to play the odds. If that's not there, um, it may present itself after. Um, but we're going to work play side. Now, if the hitch is open, our wide out out there will stick it in the ground and come to a stop. And if he doesn't feel like I'm going to get a throw or he hitches and the demeanor of the quarterback is play side and it's away from me, if I'm the X receiver and, and I hitch and there's no ball coming, because really the ball should be halfway there right now. You know, hitches were thrown yesterday. So if there's no ball coming and the demeanor of the quarterback is looking the, others, the other way, I'm going to reaccelerate and I'm going to run the under route. So I'm giving my, my basic or my turn in an opportunity to clear out. And then I'm going to go and attack the grass that is vacated underneath. And that's what our wideout is doing here. And, and truthfully, I think one of the things we coach him to do is um, he decided to release inside. We would want him to, to push and elevate that thing to at least five yards try to get his shoulder into the chest of the corner here and, and shoulder lift him and push this thing to five, stick our right foot in the ground and we can continue our under route because we know in this scenario where they're impeding us, we're not going to catch the hitch. So we can continue the route and go threaten the grass underneath on the under uh, almost continuously. You know, one of the things I, I didn't finish explaining on the, uh, on the other rep was going back to our left wide out. If they want to sell the vertical on the way by on a press corner and stick their foot in the ground and throw the corner by and then come underneath. And in most cases, when we're employing that technique, it's man. And then we're going to keep our route on the run. If, if he feels like he can win inside, so there's no, uh, I don't care which way they go. Uh, I care that they're successful. And so we have a better shot after they work their release technique to release inside. Then they want to look lean and drive this. So we want to release inside. We're going to look vertically down the field. We want to lean back out and try to stay in the paint here. We don't want to get, um, we don't want them to melt us inside so that, you know, our, our angle looks like this. And now we're, we're, our route's getting watered down and we're getting mashed inside. So we want to look downfield, we want to lean back out, and then we're going to stick our outside foot in the ground, almost as if we're trying to step on their foot, and then drive and create some separation. And again, we may stay on the move if they carry us. If we know we're detaching and it's kind of a press quarters corner, then we may hug it up um, behind or in front of the zone defender. So they, they have uh, the flexibility to release the way they feel like they can be the most successful and they know how to run that based on man or zone technique.
The QBs are trusting the receivers. So one more time going through this corner, no, there's no grass. I'm looking through the corner to, to nothing. I've got no grass up there at all. Doesn't excite me. My eyes go to the snag. We're sitting in open grass here. He's snagging up where he should. Ball's coming out. And again, we'd like to see the ball really delivered to the inside shoulder here. And then our receivers are aware enough, you know, to try and turn that thing up the field. I do think, though, that emphasizing ball placement on a lot of our plays has helped create greater, you know, uh, run after catch yardage than before I used to emphasize it. Two by two, off tight end of the field. So our, our second receiver, our two, our slot here is now pushing this thing underneath what we would call a skelly corner, a skelly drop corner. That corner is flying out of there, hips are turned, velocity is high. He feels like he can win underneath, and so he does. And he keeps his angle flat because if the corner is not a factor, then I want my angle uh, to be what could beat the safety. We call this QBF, Brian. This is just quarterback-friendly angle, which, which means we want to be downhill. So the quarterback is throwing to us on a downhill angle. And this looks more like a speed out. But this is how we would adjust our corner and run this thing um, if we're running it off of a safety. Quarterback likes the corner. We're triggering the ball in good time. The ball placement is excellent. We're putting that ball out in front under the chin of the receiver. The defender has no chance to undercut this throw. No chance to touch the ball at all. Um, and I think that's about as, as good as it's going to get on this picture. If he didn't like this corner route, he would wind up getting off the snag uh, and going to the shoot route. As for the snag route here, you know, and this is a, this is a younger receiver running this. He's pushing inside off his first step. That, that's, not, that's not what we want. We want to push it off of the second step, okay, to promote the corner bailing if, in fact, that's his job. And then we, we're a little bit higher off the line of scrimmage so that we can see this scenario. We can see what's happening from inside. So he should be a little deeper before he pushes. If somebody is lifting, then we can just sit it down. We've got grass, so what, why, keep, why keep running inside? One, it takes longer now. Don't want anything to take longer than it has to. Two, I'm taking myself to the defender. So if he's going to continue this, he should go all the way up inside and hug his hip. But it's much better, much quicker, and uh, would be more correct if he just sat it down right there. If he just sat this thing down there, we could throw to his outside shoulder and spin this thing off away from that defender because he's opening hips and getting depth. Instead, we're going underneath him, which we definitely don't want to do here. Now he can see us and he can flatten out and adjust to us. I'd rather push behind him, lose his eyes. Either way, we're going to occupy him to stay inside if he's covering us, so it doesn't matter. So we'd rather go where he can't see us. But the, the best thing for this slot to do is to push up the field deeper and then sit it down right there. That'd be the perfect snag for this scenario. So now, you, you know, what comes with giving them more flexibility uh, is, is you having the, uh, the patience for them to understand these scenarios. You know, we're going we're gonna to run 100 reps of this and the first 50 aren't going to be perfect. You know, because they have to learn all these scenarios. And then after a while, you get to a point where you feel like we have a great feel for it. The quarterback has confidence in it. And very rarely do you actually run the concept where there are any mistakes. Um, and, and you also have to be willing to understand that what the receiver sees on the run isn't necessarily what we're going to see on film. And there may be two different options that a receiver could have. He may have felt like here that there was more lateral movement by this level two defender and he'd go hug it up behind. He may have felt like, you know what, I can, I can hug it up right here. I can set it down right there because he's getting vertical. And you've just got to be willing to live. You know, you can't tell them they're going to be flexible and then talk to them about how they're always wrong because some of this stuff is gray area. What we want them to do 
is be decisive with whatever decision they are making, be decisive about the route they're running. And then what I always ask them is this, did the decision you make versus zone coverage put you in open grass? Did the decision you make help get you covered? And that's really, that's the basis for deciding whether they are right or they were wrong on any of our past concepts. And, and uh, money is no different. So we're going to start in, a, in, a, in an off trips formation here. We're motioning over. And then we're going to run the corner here now from an off tight end position. So we're going to make this a two by two formation and then we're still releasing the back out in the sheet. Is a really good vertical push by the tight end. Um, the quarterback here, and you can tell by the depth of his three steps. What I don't like about our quarterback here is you got that old school 1980s, you know, that decade where everybody had their head leaning back, coming out of the under snap and, and getting into their five or seven step drop. So one of the things I'm trying to break with this quarterback is, is getting him to maintain um, a little bit more of an upright balanced position when he's dropping. But he's using our three casual drop, which is the one that takes the longest. Um, and that's what he's comfortable with. He likes that rhythm throwing the first look on this play. And I'm fine with it. As long as the ball's not coming out late, and as long as we're making good decisions, I don't care what their drop is. What I care about is what works for them. And every quarterback is different. Are there some plays where we know that this is the best way to do it? Yes. So we'll coach it that way and we'll insist that we do it that way. You know, on these plays, you know, you watch Gardner Minshew, who ran this play to perfection with Coach Leach. He was a one reload guy. He was a one slide guy, and that's what he liked, and he'd like to, he'd sit there. Um, you know, Sam likes three quick. Some of our guys like one reload. Jacoby Criswell here likes three casual, and so I'm good with it if we trigger it on time. Corner's open. He's looking through the corner to the grass. We've got grass. Balls away on time like this. Um, maybe if I wanted to be critical, I could say, let's trigger this thing a little quicker. Hey, why don't you try three quick? Maybe we can get this ball out a little quicker. And that'd give the tight end a shot at catching this now instead of still waiting on the ball. And then we get left, right, left, three, chop this thing and get up the sideline. And those are little things that we can, we can talk about and coach and spend time on if I don't have four other concepts that I need to teach in addition to it. I like the wide out here. He's gonna burst his feet a little bit, try to, try to get the corner to drop his heels. We're releasing inside. He does push to a depth of five. He is wrapping the, the uh, second defender inside. And right now I think what he's trying to decide is do I have man coverage or, or zone coverage? And then the shoot route actually gets to his depth of two yards. The only thing I would ask our shoot route to do here is not to throttle down before the paint. And until you're looking back at the quarterback uh, and seeing the, the line of fire for the shoot throw, and until the, the paint, the numbers show in your eye line, you should continue to move and we don't want to throttle. He's, he's throttling prematurely here. So we want to get as much of a lateral stretch on this as we can. So we haven't had to work backside yet. I, I think we're still working our four-step dig and then the hitch to the under on the backside. I like what our, I, our snag has time. He can be patient. And I think we're doing a good job of that here. We don't have to be in a hurry. All right, and, 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 and that is a product of wanting to make the corner the first look. So just, just looking at this rep, and I remember reviewing it with those guys, Probably could pull the trigger a little quicker if we get in a three quick. All right, which speeds up our, our second, third step in the drop. The ball could come out a little bit quicker, right? And we could probably landmark a bang right here instead of putting the ball on his back hip where we don't want it. Last place we want a corner throw is on the back hip. So if that ball came out sooner, you know, we could really hit this thing here and the tight end has an opportunity to lower his shoulder and get up the field. It also means you're triggering the ball quicker. The faster we can get the ball out of the quarterback's hands to a legitimate route, the better for us. Now we have the tight end on the other side. We're actually throwing this concept to the open twins again. 
Great, great job by the slot. So he has a press corner. We've got all kinds of grass. If anything, maybe, uh, maybe we could have a slightly higher angle on the corner, but we're splitting hairs. You know, he's flattening this angle. He's going to QBF this thing because he can, and it gives the safety absolutely no shot at playing the football. And actually, this looks like an elevated nickel. So he's giving the defender no shot at playing the football. And, you know, so what will we talk about? Our quarterback here, we talked to him about. And, and this one, I think Sam's holding it just a hair because we've got some color underneath and he's just making sure that there's nobody elevating to get on the corner route. And I, and I, I like this. The corner happens, the ball's out now. Our snag does elevate to five. Um, he may have felt like he had man coverage and so that's why he's continuing. He doesn't really have to here. So what we coach our slot to do is say, hey, look, you detach, nobody's running with you. You've got nothing but grass, sit it down. That way if snag, if uh, if Sam did not throw this corner, the snag is a great, a great option. Somebody defensively here is messing up and they're not sitting in. Um, you've got two guys sitting on the shoot route, which obviously is not what they want in this coverage. Now you couple that with the offense being in tempo and I think the days of the defense running around like a Chinese fire drill when you're in tempo are gone. You don't really get that advantage anymore. It might happen once a game, and so you take advantage of it. But there's two other advantages, and, and I think uh, one of them is you get some mistakes like that. They get less time to ID formations before you're actually snapping the football, and you do get more coverage mistakes. You get more run fit mistakes. Um, and then the third one is a whole different topic, but it's just winning the war of attrition as the game goes on. We have great success at the end of drives. We have great success at the end of the half. We have great success at the end of games a lot of the times because we're in great shape. We're able to handle being in tempo the whole game. And I, I don't know how you train that defensively, particularly if you're not a tempo team yourself offensively and you're seeing it all week while you're practicing. Here we've got a corner that's gonna go press bail. So our corner route is to going to split the two of them and try to occupy the two of them. I like that our snag, and this is a better example of uh, having an inside defender in here. An inside defender opens hips and lifts initially. And so our wideout probably could have hugged up even sooner, but he's hugging up here. He's sitting it down because I can get open a lot sooner in grass here than if I carry my route all the way to the next defender. Now, if that defender is sifting, not flying, but he's sifting, I'm probably going to accelerate and work past him. That defender is triggering and he's got a higher velocity. I'm going to push past him, but I'm going to expect to hug up a lot sooner because I can. So I, I would really like to see right now our, our wide out sit it down right there and we can throw him the football. And because our quarterback probably sees the blur inside of the backer, he goes corner, got nothing. We can see that in the drop. By the time we get to the top of the drop, and unless it's one reload, if we're in a three quick or three casual, by the time we get to the top of the drop, we have already and should have already made a decision on the corner route. We're either sticking our final foot in the ground and the ball is coming out, or we're sticking the final foot in the ground and we've already made the decision that we're not throwing the corner. So either way, when that third foot hits, we should either be driving the ball to the snag route or throwing the ball to the corner route. Thank you. I got it's my mid-meeting coffee coach right there. We are third foot in the ground, right? And he's done such a great job that he's got he's got press bill corner. He knows right now I got no grass. I'm off this corner. He probably knows that in the first two steps. He's looking at the snag for whatever reason, he doesn't like it. And I, I would think that it's the blur inside. And so really on his third foot, and this is excellent transition, the ball is going to our shoot route now. And this is a true freshman quarterback that just arrived in January. Here we are beginning of April. He's thrown this route five times. 
you know, uh, may, may be more on his own in PLPs, but he's thrown this route in organized practice five times, and we're already able to work this ball all the way to the third look. And really, what is first look or second look time? So the ball is coming out. Some people call this triangle concept. Some call it a star concept. You know, wh whatever, it doesn't matter. We're going through this three-step process really quick. We're getting the ball out. And I, I think this is something that all of our quarterbacks right now are very comfortable with. So this is, this is Drake May. We're kind of full stepping with our left foot. Uh, maybe not. I don't think it came out of the grass. He's just kind of pivoting a little bit. So this is uh, right, left, right, stick the ball in the ground. I mean, stick the foot in the ground and deliver corner to snag. And then the ball, when we're running it, it's in rapid fire. And all the quarterbacks are throwing all three routes at the same time. You typically will see the corner route come out first. And then the snag and the shoot pretty much come out at the same time. And that's usually the rhythm that you'll see the balls get launched as we're throwing uh, money. So I like this. Um, I don't think there's any chance unless you actually have a free runner of ever getting your quarterback hit. I think it's a solid, efficient decision. This gives us a chance to go get, you know, a four to eight, maybe 10, 12 yards on a quick pop. Um, great first down play. We like it on third and medium. So we got a press corner that stays. There's no bail. We're throwing this to the boundary away from the tight end. The slot is dipping shoulder. So if he thinks he can win the race, then we'll either one arm chop it and or we'll dip our shoulder and work through the second level defender. And now he's going to turn that corner. If you notice, this, this corner is just a little bit higher because of all the grass that we have. And, it, and it, you know, I put this one on here just to uh, review one small coaching point that I think uh, – we need to stress is that wherever the receiver goes, he's right. And, and if he's not, then we're gonna correct it after the snap and on film. But on the play, we, you know, once we run this a, a million times and we understand it and know it, our quarterback is responsible to hit the receiver wherever he, he's in open grass, hit the receiver. And so we, we do not talk about, I'm not saying it's wrong in any way, stretch or form, but we don't talk about landmarks on the field with regards to where we're throwing the football. And we don't talk about depth as much. Um, we talk about depth with regards to breaks, but not depth with regards to where we're throwing the ball. And so, you know, this is a very common mistake. Our quarterback is under throwing this on the corner route. You know, and this is, uh, so our receiver is pushing a slightly higher angle and he's gonna let the ball flatten him, but we need a more accurate football. Um, and this ball is thrown out ahead of him just a little bit. You know, our landmark is to throw to the chin. And we, we can do a better job of throwing this football. And, you know, we have a wide open corner with a lot of grass. But when you, when you run this thing, the number of times that we get it because of the smaller playlist, this really doesn't, uh, this problem doesn't exist after the first few days. You know, they, they understand, they get the rhythm down and they understand that, look, I could have a QBF flat speed out type angle. I can have the angle that you draw in the playbook that we don't have, which is on that 45 degree deal and I'm gonna throw him flat. Or we can have a slightly higher angle and I've got to push the ball up the field a little bit. Uh, but in all of those cases, and this is what I sell our receivers and quarterbacks on, when we're playing against a zone team or just zone coverage on a particular play, we're never making a contested catch. If you study our drop back game, we always are throwing the receivers in open grass. And that's the benefit. That's, the, that's what you get on the positive side of throwing the grass and allowing for some route flexibility by the receivers. You know, these guys are talented enough passers to stick their foot in the ground and throw the right throw to a wide open receiver in open grass. And to me, that's a much smaller learning curve um, than trying to strike point and landmark, field landmark, every throw that you make. Um, and then, you know, the other issue is I think you get fewer contested throws. And we're able to get off guys. So if we have a blur 
you know, which is which is us seeing the color of another jersey from another team anywhere around the route. We're going to get off it and we're going to progress to the next step. So we're not holding the football. You'll see more contested catches against man coverage. That's inevitable. But the approach against man coverage is to create a little bit of separation. You're never going to get the same amount of separation of grass that you get in zone coverage. So we have to create minimal separation, which really is like, look, I said, if, if, if I can slide a piece of paper between a defender and the receiver, we have enough room. We have enough room to place the ball and put it somewhere where the defender can't touch it. So if we can get any detachment from a man defender, then it really comes down to how, how uh, talented, how artful the quarterback is about placing the ball where we can go attack it. In one-on-ones, we don't even throw the football to a receiver if he's not open. I don't want them getting into the habit. If the receiver has not earned the right to get the ball in one-on-ones, he's running a route and not getting a ball. And I, I don't want our quarterbacks to ever be in the habit of throwing a, a route or a situation that he would not readily want to throw in a game. I don't want to practice anything that we don't want to do in a game. So what, what that does is it forces receivers to have to go earn separation so that they can earn the throw. And it, and it keeps our quarterbacks from doing anything on the negative side that we don't want them doing in a game. And so that, that's, this is a, that's, to me, on this play, missing that corner is a very common uh, scenario that we get early on with younger quarterbacks who are adjusting and becoming more familiar and acquainted with routes that we have on concepts that can definitely have different angles. We do the same thing with our posts. Uh, we have the same similarity with our vertical routes, in-breaking routes, all of that stuff. So it's, um, I don't think it's expensive in any way. Uh, we, we install the whole offense in four days. It never looks good, Brian, in four days. Um, but we have the mapping of the play and we have the understanding of the play. And then from day five on, we work on perfecting all of these smaller coaching points that I talked about. So I don't know if it's the best way or even the right way, but it works for us. We believe in it. And so and that's, that's kind of how we approach not just this play, but our entire passing game.